to Chicago. This is great. I'm sorry about the weather. Oh, wait. <laughs> There's sun. <laughs> so I usually am apologizing for our weather. So you guys get a great sunny day. Anyway, as Captain Ken said, my name is Susan, and I've been doing these tours for over 20 years. I'm actually a piano teacher during the week. So um, I put on my tour guide hat on the weekends, and I hope that I can impart some of my passion for Chicago to you today on this gorgeous day. We're so happy it's gorgeous because if you had taken the store yesterday, that would have been a different story. How many of you are visiting from out of town today? Wow, lots of people. How about out of the country? I always tell people that if you're in Chicago, especially for a short time, the architecture tour is the perfect thing to do. It's the number one thing to do because you get a snapshot of how beautiful the city is. You see lots of beautiful building, groundbreaking architecture, but you learn a lot about the city and the history of the city. You never know what you will see today. We probably will see some of the bridges lifted because it's bridge lift season in May where all the boats are coming in um, to stay for the summer. So it's really fun. I have my camera all ready to go just in case we see that because you just never know. So Chicago goes back to the 1600s when Jacques Marquette and Louis Joliet, were, who were of French origin, bridged their way into this area and foresaw that this was an important place to protect the nature of the fact of where the river met meets the lake. However, in the early 1800s, we were only about 150 people, and believe it or not, we were a landlocked city. Despite all this water around us, we had no way to get shipping to and from this area. The Erie Canal was built, and then the Illinois and Michigan Canal was built. So we went from 150 people in the early 1800s to over a million people by the end the century. So we grew very, very quickly. Um, now, this is a 90-minute tour. We are on what's called Ogden Slip. So this is not officially the Chicago River. We will leave the dock. We'll go around the bend. We will go into the main branch. We will also visit both the north and the south branch, too, and I said 90 minutes. So we are, as I said, on Ogden Slip, and we're next to what used to be an old warehouse building. This is the River East Lofts building. So this is a rental apartment building and commercial space. But this is an example of a lot of what you will see on the Chicago River, which is called adaptive reuse. It's taking an older building or an older warehouse and converting it into different purposes. Because you have to remember that Chicago, uh, Chicago has been built over many years. So you see a lot of examples of these older warehouses here. But you'll see lots of other kinds of architecture too. We're in what's called River East. This is um, part of Streeterville. Streeterville is one of 77 neighborhoods in Chicago. And River East has a lot of residential buildings. So over here to the left, these two towers that are of red brick are condominium buildings called Riverview 1 and Riverview 2. Behind there's a tall tower that looks very, it's got a wavy facade and that is the St. Regis. Not only is that a condominium, but they just opened up the St. Regis Hotel portion um, at which you can stay for, I was looking at prices last night, they went anywhere from $870 a night to about $3,000 a night. So, real premium <laughs> hotel there. And as we go past, I'll tell you more about the St. Regis. Now, straight ahead, look at the building that has a Gothic top. That is the Chicago Tribune building, and that represents one of the styles you'll see today, which is the Beaux-Arts style. So that building is a very European-looking design. It was home to the Chicago Tribune newspaper. It's a 1920s building with housing hood. And that Gothic top is actually patterned after the butter tower of the Rouen Cathedral in France. You'll also see Art Deco. Art Deco was made popular around the same time, 1920s and 30s, but it's much more streamlined. I like to call it a jazz age or industrial age style that really focused on these stylized designs and opulent materials such as the old marble. Now, really yeah, there was a man named Mies Van Broek. He was a German-born architect who uh, oversaw the Bauhaus in Germany and came to Chicago after the Nazis shut that down. When he was in Chicago, he rethought 
with the vocabulary of architecture, and we call that the international style. That's really dark glass and steel, emphasis off ornamentation, and more about the stripped down, pared down, mid-century look. He was famous for saying less is more. Postmodernists after him said less is a bore. We want to see that in detail. We want to see interesting features on the building. So postmodernism of the 1980s and 90s emphasizes um, ornamentation that will reflect history as well as context. So just to give you a snapshot of all our styles today. So the first building we will talk about will be on our left in just a moment, and it's in the international style, although it's more in the shape of a clover leaf. You think of that mid-century international style as more rectangular, but this one is not. This is Lake Point Tower Condominium. When it was first constructed in the 1960s, it was the tallest rental apartment, uh, apartment building in the world by Heinrich and Shipwright, who were students of Mies van der Rohe. And that curve is just perfect so that neighbors cannot see into other apartments, so they can plan them really well, but it also helps with wind forces on the building. Now, this is also the only building you will see outside of Dusabo Lakeshore Drive, which is the highway we just went under. Years ago, there was a mandate that was created that everything on the lakefront should be forever clear and free for public enjoyment. Residential buildings and somehow through a loophole, Lake Point Tower Condominium got through. And uh, so that's the only residential building you will see outside of the drive. Now we're passing Wheatley Pier. That's our number one tourist attraction. It's a recreational pier that I will talk about more in detail when we come back because we'll be able to see it better. But that's a wonderful place to visit. And then if we were to go to the left, we would be heading towards the lake, Lake Michigan. If you ask any Chicago resident, what are your favorite things about living in Chicago? Number one is usually living near this beautiful lake. Um, it really kind of humanizes everything when you're in the bustling city. You can always come out to the lake. We have a lakeshore path that runs all the way up and down the drive. So you can get on your bicycle, you can walk, you can run. It's really fun. So we love having access to this lake. So we're going to head the opposite direction because we have a lot to see on the river today. And we're going under many bridges. I think you will see some of those bridges. I hope you will see some of those bridges raised today because it is bridge lift season. Um, we have the most movable bridges of any city in the entire world. And they are called Trunnion Vascular Bridges, which means they're operating on the principle of weights and balances where you have the leaf of the bridge counterbalanced by a weight that's embedded in the soil. This one is a double decked. You see this pathway here, this is the flyover. That's actually an extension of the lakefront trail and also helped open up the traffic here on the bridge, the pedestrian and cycling traffic. It used to get really long on this bridge. But this bridge is named after President Franklin D. Roosevelt. It was dedicated to him. He gave his quarantine speech about the upcoming years. Hotel, which is in this lower portion, as 
Uh, and you can look that up for prices. It's, it's quite a top amenity hotel. Now, watch your eyes with the sun, but if you can see that open space towards the top in the tallest tower, that's an, a completely open space. Some people ask, did, are they still finishing the building? No, that will be there always. That is to help resist wind forces. So if you've ever been to the top of a really tall building and felt the wind on the building, it, sometimes you can feel that sway just a little bit, but enough that it can be unnerving. So that is a blowhole through which the, the wind can go through and it decreases the wind forces on the building. And it helps those people living way up there not have to feel that all the time. Now, there was an architect named Harry Weiss who loved the shape of a triangle because it reminded him of sails to a sailboat. And he loved sailing. This building on the left in the shape of a triangle is the Swiss Hotel. It was designed by Harry Weiss and it actually is a great shape for a hotel because it offers great views on every side. The back side is actually facing um, the park that is surrounded by all of these buildings and also they can see Millennium Park. Behind that is another building with wavy balconies and that's another Genie Gang building called the Aqua. The Aqua is home to the Radisson Blue Hotel, as well as rental and condominiums, and it was inspired by limestone outcroppings in Illinois, so it looks kind of like a climbing wall. Now, Columbus Drive Bridge is the second longest and telling their age, but they're all checked regularly. Now this whole area on the left originally was uh, called Illinois Center. It still is, but it was supposed to be entirely designed by Mies van der Rohe. So I mentioned him as the author of the international style. Look at the building on the left. That is a dark glass and steel rectangular shape right before Michigan Avenue. That was designed by the office of Lee Spandro. So that's that typical international style that's associated with him. So when you see those kind of buildings, those I-beams going up the sides of the windows, the dark glass and steel box, that rectangular shape, most often that is that international style of Lee Spandro. Quickly looking on the right, coming up, there is a glass pavilion for all of you Apple device owners. This is our flagship Apple store designed by uh, the firm of British designer Norman Foster, 2017. Now they have a lot of uh, Apple productions here. You can watch classes, but then below is the, bird, the uh, commercial area where you can buy Apple products. That overhanging roof is to look somewhat like the top of a laptop, but it's also a nod to Frank Lloyd Wright, whose prairie style used those overhanging roofs, but they were called mm -hmm. they are called Williams roofs. And so that is a modern nod to Frank Lloyd Wright, who whose uh, original home and studio are in Illinois about 20 minutes from here. Quarters 
as an extended stay hotel. And that is one of the thinnest buildings in Chicago, only 250 square feet at the top. So thin that past the 37th floor, there's no room for an elevator shaft. Speaking of elevators, the next building has a great elevator story. So look at the jeweler's building, this building that has a dome on top, smaller domes on the lower corners. This was designed in 1926 by the same designer as did the Flatiron Building in New York City. His name was Frederick Dinkelberg. Now for the jewelry industry, there was a, a car elevator. So you could drive your car into the elevator and be transported all the way up through 22 floors. So that was security for jewelry vendors. All right, so we saw those three Beaux-Arts style buildings, very European, very classical looking. We turn now to postmodernism. Remember I said, he said less is more, postmodern said less is a bore. So often you see references to history or context. The building on the left that looks like it's wearing a gray plaid suit is 35 West Wacker, home to Leo Burnett Advertising Firm, one of the largest advertising firms in the world, brought you Tony the Tiger as well, well as the Pillsbury Doughboy. And we hear, by the way, the ringing of the bells, so pretty soon we're going to be seeing the breathers going up. Ooh.
And then the Blue Glass building right next to it is sitting on a very historic piece of property. That's where the Wigwam Assembly Hall was uh, located in the 1800s, and that's where Lincoln received his nomination for president. All right. So we are temporarily leaving the main branch. We're headed into the south branch now. And we're going under a double-deck Trunion Bass Bridge. Now see that elevated train? It's called the Green Line. You might be able to see the green sign there. Um, but we have an elevated train system that goes all over the place. If you took the Green Line about 20 minutes west, you would end up in Oak Park, which is where Frank Lloyd Wright's original studio are located, as well as several houses he designed. So that's the train to take if you want to go see tour of that. All right, let's start on the left. I know everybody's looking at the building on the right. I'm saving that for last. So let's start with the left. This uh, red brick building is the Great Lakes building and that was designed in 1910 by premier designers of the office and a warehouse industry. Their names were Halliburton and Roche. It's got a very regular window um, design hiding a metal frame inside. And I mentioned that because metal frame construction was new back in the early 1900s. Buildings were generally what we call load-bearing buildings, which means the weight of a building was borne on its walls. Consequently, the walls had to be super thick and buildings could not go very high. William LeBaron Jenny, who was an Army engineer and architect, decided to come up with a plan to put a metal frame inside a building, hang the walls on like hanging curtains, we call those curtain walls, and as a result, buildings could, the walls were much lighter and buildings could go a lot higher. Now we see a culmination of that in the Bank of America building on the left. This is one of our newer buildings one of the tallest office buildings in Chicago, and this is by Getch Partners. It's got state-of-the-art everything, including recycling the steel at the bottom at the river level. You'll see that beveled steel. That is recycled from the original building on this property, which was a 1950s building called General Grove Properties. Do we have any opera lovers aboard? Me. No. <laughs> I usually get one like yeah there. That's okay. I will encourage you to at least go with one opera to see this building. This is the Civic Opera Building. This is an Art Deco building, 1930 by Graham Anderson, Ropes and White. Art Deco. Look at the theatrical faces, the musical instruments, all that stylized design that represents Art Deco. Um, this is also inspired by the Opera Garnier in, for, in Paris, the Paris Opera. Now, if you don't love opera, just try it once to get in this building because it's magnificent. The lobby space is absolutely beautiful. These oversized, gorgeous um, lanterns, red carpeting, gold casing, everything that makes Art Deco really special and beautiful. In my humble opinion, this is not necessarily fact, but I think it's the most beautiful theater space in Chicago. So give opera a chance once just to get in the building. CME Group is in this building here we're passing that used to be home to the Chicago Mercantile Exchange Center. And this is by Fuji Keller Johnson and Associates. There were no windows in that sense, unfortunately. Put them in the VP building. Now on the right, there are two identical buildings that are in that international style. However, these are designed by Skidmore, Owens, and Merrill. So these were slightly different than East Andrews design in that their, the window space is a little bit wider. It's more of a square shape than a rectangular shape. So you can see slight differences in the way that was realized here. But I like to call the international style a look through me style. So your eyes are really drawn to the inside of the building, not so much on a sunny day. Like on a sunny day, you see more of the facade, but most every other light especially at nighttime, you're not looking at the building, you're looking through the building. And that's exactly what Mies van der wanted in his style, to have a real fluidity of space. Now these were done in the 1960s by Skid Borrowings and Merrill. 1970s, they did this modern building on the right, but I'll draw your attention to the glass pavilion attached to it that has X-bracing. That is by Bruce 
Scram who designed the Hancock Tower. And you see that X bracing on the Hancock Tower as well. So this was yeah. a bit of an experimentation for the Hancock Tower. The X bracing actually allows the structure to be born on its walls again through that X bracing. So that's column free structure on the inside. And that's actually where the Mercantile Exchange Center used to be. Those were their trading floors that they wanted unobstructed view. This next building that originally was called one of the Gateway Buildings, this is Gateway 4, is by uh, James Stefano. And over these railroad tracks, so you can hear the trains revving up to go. There are about 13 tracks under there, and Chicago for a long time was the true railroad hub of the nation. So we have a lot of rail, a lot of tracks that converge here, and those predated all the buildings you're seeing. All these buildings were actually built over the tracks, so I don't know how they did it, but they were able to straddle those platforms and not interrupt train service while they did it as well. Now, in the 1930s, we had a huge need for a big post office because we were the largest parcel post area in the country. So this building on the right is our old post office from 1932 to 1997 when it moved out. As you can see, it's an office building now home to Uber Freight and Walgreens and other companies. This is an Art Deco building by Graham Anderson Probst and White, the same architects as brought to the Chicago Opera Building, or the Civic Opera Building. Now, this drive here, formerly known as Congress Parkway, is now Ida B. Wells Parkway, goes straight through the center of the building. That hole in the building was actually designed with the building, but Congress Parkway was not built for another 25 years after. buildings to go up there. The one that's behind this new construction is called the Cooper. The Cooper was named after an artist colony, a family named the Coopers. Also, there's another nod to history. You'll see boulders that are scattered throughout this park area, as well as put together to make the seating area we call South Bank Park. Those boulders were found as they started to dig and develop this area. They excavated them and they were a part of Grand Central Station, which used to be on this location. So as I mentioned, Chicago truly was a railroad hub and we had these grand old railway, you know, rail stations, um, so a lot of which they were demolished and Grand Central Station was one of those. So again, that recycling and nod to history too. Now this round, space-age looking building coming up with the harbor underneath is um, River uh, City. This was designed by Bertram Goldberg. Now, Bertram Goldberg was a student of Mies van der Rohe who used a lot of rectangles and squares at right angles. Bertram Goldberg, on the other hand, said there are no right angles in nature, so my designs are going to be different. So they're going to be round and circular, and you see that in this, this, is a, this design. Um, he was a real proponent of the idea of people living in the city in the 1980s when that wasn't a popular idea. 
tell you where the Green Chicago Fire of 1871 began. So this was a horrific fire for Chicago. Um, it burned four and a half square miles of property. It left three, it left a hundred thousand people without homes and over 300 people dead. So it was terrible for Chicago, and it started right there. Now there is a story of Mrs. O'Leary's cow. I imagine a lot of you have heard this story where there was a cow owned by Mrs. O'Leary. She had a farm here and the cow knocked the lantern over and started this horrific fire. However, there were two journalists who reported that story but what we never heard is 10 years after the fire, they said, we just made that up. It looked good. So poor Mrs. O'Leary, poor cow, got blamed for the fire. We don't know exactly how it happened, but we do know Chicago had been terribly dry all summer, and everything in Chicago was wood and cast iron. As we head back, you see this old power station. This is no longer used, but this is an example of really amazing what we call art modern architecture, and it's in jeopardy. So preservationists want to keep this building. After the fire, actually the next day, there were investors out on trains to the East Coast and they went there to advertise Chicago as the next best place to invest money. They said, look, we've been through this terrible tragedy. You can invest in Chicago. It's going to be the next great city. Within two years, it looked as if nothing had happened in Chicago and it really opened up the legacy for the architecture we have today and the many architects that came to Chicago to start something new and inventive. Names like Louis Sullivan and Dave Martin Adler who did the Auditorium Theater. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's on uh, Michigan Avenue and Congress Parkway. It is a beautiful, beautiful old building from the, eight, uh, the late 1800s and it's an example of a load bearing building with very, very deep walls. It was what brought people from all over the world to see the architecture of Chicago. So, um, Chicago has quite a legacy. Now straight ahead, there is a tall, dark glass building with white antennas on top. That used to be the tallest building in the world. That is the Willis Tower, formerly known as the Sears Tower, which I always... Sears Tower is always first on my tongue. I have to make myself say Willis Tower because it was the Sears Towers for, for such a long time. But in 1974, it was designed as the tallest building in the world. It is 1,451 feet tall, and it is about 110 stories high. So Bruce Graham was the architect. He also did the Hancock Tower. Plaza Khan was the building engineer. And story has it they were both heavy smokers. And we were talking one day and said, look, you take this cigarette, you stand it up, it's going to fall down. But you take the cigarette and put it in a pack, you can stand that up very easily. What if we designed a building based on that design? So think of the Willis Tower as a very thin, tall pack of cigarettes, where you have towers that are bound together at the bottom. They're nine tubes or towers at the very bottom, and then they fall off at various heights. So you have two that fall off at the 50th floor, two that fall off at the 66th, three more at the 90th, and finally two more at 110. So it's a very strong kind of construction called tool construction. It can go infinitely high. And it was one of the first designs in that kind of uh, structure. So although it's not the tallest building anymore, in fact, think of the tallest buildings. They're almost twice as tall as the Willis Tower, which boggles my mind, like the Burj Khalifa and the Jeddah Tower. They're close to 3,000. However, this has enough steel to make 15,000 cars. It has enough concrete to pave 24 miles of two-lane highway, and it has enough space to pave 16 blocks. So it, by any stretch of the imagination, it is a very, very tall building. Now let's look to the right a little bit and we see a tower with a statue on top. That is the Chicago Board of Trade. This is a 1930 tower by Holliburd and Root. It's Art Deco. 
And that statue series is the goddess of agriculture. That's where we get the name cereal from. Cereals. Now look below, there's an addition. Same pyramidal roof, a glass addition with an ornament that's actually a replica of a trading floor. That was done in 1987 by Helmut Jan. So those pyramidal roofs are actually a reflection of what was popular during the Art Deco time. Art Deco loved using Egyptian motifs because King Tut's tomb had been discovered, so there was this craze and interest in Egyptian motifs. So you often see Egyptian motifs embedded in Art Deco architecture. And a pyramidal roof is one of those um, kinds of designs. The building that has lots of balconies right in front of us here, that's a condo building. That's 235 West Van Buren. And some people refer to that as the dot dot dash building or the Lego building because of its geometric proportions. That was completed in 2009. What I read about it was that it originally was designed to be more of a mid-priced um, building, condominium building for people who wanted to live in the, the city and not have to pay exorbitant prices. And then this salmon colored tower right in front of the Willis Tower is 311 South Wack. Now, as we get from under the bridge, take a look again. You probably noticed the crown on the wall. on more glass. So this one almost looks like a skeleton upon which 
the glass is hung. And so that is a really great example of how glass has become more and more important in buildings where you see these super tall buildings that are all glass. And of course they're on a frame, but they look so much lighter than some of the older buildings. Our, our load-bearing buildings in Chicago are beautiful. Like if you get a chance to see the auditorium theater or the Manhattan building or the Rookery building is so beautiful. That's on the South Street. I highly recommend that because they are just gorgeous, but they also show you how massive the facade had to be to fit in the building. So again, going past these buildings on the left, these what I like to call the look through me buildings, your eyes truly are drawn to the inside of the buildings and there's uh, that sense that the wall was just an envelope for space and that was how skyscrapers started to develop and what these contribute, these Vandrove contributed to the skyscraper technology and design. The building that looks like a waterfall is by Helmut Jan. He also designed the addition to the Chicago Board of Trade. Um, sadly, he passed away two years ago. He was uh, a resident about an hour, I don't know how far he was from the city, but his offices were here. He was German-born international architect, and uh, he was in a bike accident. He was 81 years old, and he was an avid cyclist, working full-time, designing great buildings, so we were really sad to lose him. Two North Riverside Plaza is an Art Deco building that was designed for the Chicago Daily News, a now defunct newspaper. It's an Art Deco building, and if you look at the designs on the wings, those are various forms of uh, early written communication. But it is the first building to have a public plaza by nature of those wings wrapping around the central portion. Up to that point, Chicago did not have public plazas. It's also the first building to use the air rights over the railway. When something is underground, it can actually sell the air above it. And so um, that is what the railway did. They sold that, that air, basically, or the property above, so that they could build all of these buildings. The Boeing building on the left is a 1990 building by Ralph Johnson. Boeing has announced its plans to move to DC its headquarters. However, they're still here. You see the Boeing icon at the top where there's a clock tower. This is in what's called the Dutch modern style or De Stiel style. So think of artists if you're familiar with Mondrian who created with rectangles and squares and multiple colors. You see multiple materials and rectangles and squares in this building as well. So it's a European modern style. And then finally, the building I know you were all looking at at the beginning of this ranch. That looks like it could possibly fall into the river because it's got such a skinny base, and that's the whole beauty of this building. 150 North Riverside was completed in 2017, and there is a railroad behind that building. So there was a very limited piece of property. So the choice was to go small or to go really tall, with a super strong base. So that is what 150 North Riverside has. That base goes into bedrock, about 110 feet into the ground, and then the building flares out like a champagne flute. It's won numerous awards for its structural engineering. It's an eye catcher. When the bridges are up, they, mim they actually mimic that same angle of the bottom of the bridge. So it's a beautiful building. Furthermore, to keep that building upright, there are huge barrels of water called mass tube, mass tube dampers that are at the top of the building. And when the wind blows upon the building, that, that barrel of water basically counterbalances the um, that, that wind force on it. So I don't know how that works, but it's pretty amazing stuff. The red sculpture on the left is called Constellation. That is by Santiago Calatrava, an international designer, if you're familiar with the Milwaukee Art Museum. He designed that absolutely beautiful museum. All right, we're headed into the North Branch, which was by far the most industrial branch for the longest time. So had you taken this tour 30 years ago, you would have seen mostly warehouses. Now you see a lot of warehouses that have been converted into residences 
more newer ones, such as this one on the left. This is Riverbend. This is a single loaded corridor condominium building, which means it's only one unit deep. Again, that railway going behind the building limited the width of the building. Where that frosted glass is, that's actually the garage space. It's so thin, there's no room for garage ramps. So um, cars would need to be uh, taken to those spots by elevator. The red brick building is an old refrigerator. This was 1908 North American Cold Storage Warehouse. Now it is the Fulton House. Look at how thick the walls are by looking at the balconies. They removed all sorts of insulation and it literally took a year and a half for the building to defrost itself before they could renovate the building and put it yeah, in the <laughs> River cottages are my favorite. These are four townhouses, 1988. Look at, you love the shape of the triangle, and you see that in the shape of the window space there, too. Those are truly iconic for Chicago. It took until from 1988 to 2015 for the first one to sell or to resell at the cost of $2.3 million. So if you have a Harry Weiss River Cottage, you stay a long time and you sell for big bucks. Now on the right is the East Bank Club. This is the largest and best known health club in the city. It was designed in 1979 by Gordon and Levin and was really the first building to break through this whole industrial area. There were no windows on the west wall and that reflects an attitude change towards the river. So I talked about in the beginning how this was a shipping river. This is how Chicago was built. But as a result, our river was toxic to the point of dangerous and nobody really wanted to even look at the river. However, we've been cleaning it up over the years, and now it's a real amenity. There are river walks, there are lots of things to enjoy. Tour boats, pleasure boats, so now it's more devoted to that. You see that reflected on the left here with Kinsey Park. Those are low to mid-rise townhouses by Papa George and Hames, very much embracing of the river, even a river walk. So this is a private gated community, but that river walk is actually open to the public during the daytime. And that reflects a mandate by uh, uh, Mayor Richard Daly, who uh, said that everybody that designs on the river must also provide a river walk. Ever since 1946. On the right, we have the Riverbank Laws. This used to be the railway terminal warehouse. Again, another conversion, 1909 by George Nimmons. And when you have these lofts, it's loft living. It's very interesting, very high ceilings, often exposed piping, sometimes exposed brickworks, and maintaining a lot of the industrial elements as a part of the history of the building. Yeah. We're coming up to a, another residential area that's on a park called Montgomery Ward Park. That used to be called the Jersey Shore actually. Um, anyway, he 
lived here and he worked for Marshall Field. Marshall Fields was our department store. Some of you might remember it. It is now Macy's on State Street. However, he decided to start his own company. So some of you may remember Montgomery Wards. Montgomery Wards went out of business in 2001. Um, but his was with a twist. His was a retail and catalog industry, meaning that he had a catalog that he could send to houses all over the country so you could shop in the privacy of your own home by just looking through the catalog, picking up the telephone, and calling Montgomery Wards and ordering what you want. Well, what do we do now? We just open up our laptops, we, we look at our phones, and we order whatever we want. So I think he really is the great, great, great grandfather of the idea of online shopping. As important as he was for commerce, he was even more important for Chicago. He had his offices on Michigan Avenue, and he started to notice that the lakefront was getting cluttered with warehouses, train tracks, garbage, you name it, it was getting less and less accessible to the public. And he said, this cannot be, we have to fight for this lakefront. So he did that. He fought in courts for about 20 years. Business people who wanted to build on the lakefront and who wouldn't, that's prime property. But he was able to successfully protect that lakefront. So that's where that saying, forever clear and free for public enjoyment, came from. Because of him, we have Millennium Park and Grand Park and the beaches and the bike paths and everything you can enjoy for free. You can thank Montgomery Ward for protecting that for you. Now that was dug out to create this island, this was a brick-making company owned by William Ogden, our first mayor, and his brother. This is called Goose Island, and if you recognize that name and you're instantly linking Goose Island beer, yep, that's where it comes from. This is an industrial island about a mile long and a half mile wide. And if you look straight ahead, you can truly see this whole area is quite industrial. So had you taken this tour about 20, 30 years ago, you would have seen mostly what you're seeing in front of us. Um, there is a concrete making yard in the distance that's called Prairie Yard 32, one of the largest concrete making, making yards in uh, the country. Kendall College is a culinary school, so people go to Kendall College to become chefs. That used to be up in Evanston, and then they took over that old warehouse building. And then looking back, as we turn to go south again, there is a tall modern tower. I'll talk about the statue in front of it in a minute, but let's talk about that modern tower. In 1974, that was the office building for Montgomery Wards, and it was designed by the same designer as did the World Trade Center towers that fell on 9-11, and his name is Minuro Yamasaki. So same designer exactly. Um, this was built, this was completed probably a year after the Trade Center Towers were completed. And not only is that solid, those solid corners are a design feature, but they're also a philosophical feature. Montgomery Ward wanted to make sure that everyone had an equal view. Again, he was very caring about, you know, just every man, every person, um, every person having equal opportunities. So he said, no corner office space in my building for the executives, I'm gonna have everybody have an equal view. So that's part of the philosophy that created the design of that building. Now that's actually Montgomery Place, which is a senior living home. And the statue, let's see, can we see her yet? She'll, yeah, we'll be able to see her as we go by. So we're coming up to another Montgomery Ward building after the bridge. We passed it, but we didn't have time to talk about it. This is Art Deco. This was the Montgomery building of 1930, and it's by Willis J. McCauley, who was an in-house architect at the time. So this statue is on top of a ziggurat tower. They're obviously doing some painting or working on the outside. She's the spirit of progress, and that was the icon for Montgomery Ward's company. She's patterned after the mythic figure, Diana, the goddess of the hunt. So take a look at this warehouse building. This is now a residential building. However, it is in Art Deco style. So imagine the care um, put into making what was a really functional 
building, but all those beautiful designs, those brown designs called bas reliefs, which are flattened designs, little butterflies at the bottom, columns at the top, and all that stylized work. Now, when this was converted later on into residences, those balconies were put on the facade. And even in that same, same stylized design, you can see spaces of groups of three. Remember, I mentioned three as being kind of a magical number. You see uh, windows and bays of three. So it's a really a beautiful building. I've never seen the inside, but I'd love to see that. On the right, we have the Chicago Tribune Printing and Processing Plant. This dates back to 1981. The Chicago Tribune newspaper is uh, uh, one of our major newspapers. And as everybody knows, the newspaper industry is kind of shrinking. Anybody still receive a newspaper at home? Yay, good for you guys. I love that. I used to also, and I kind of miss it. It was like a little gift at the door every day. I even know if the newspaper um, deliver comes to our building anymore. But anyway, um, it is shrinking, so there's less of need for such a huge space. So Chicago Tribune will be moving out. They're planning to redevelop this whole area in the next 10, 20 years. There's a Valley's Casino that is slated to be developed in this area as well. So if you take this tour, maybe even in the next two or three years, it's going to look quite different. But there are all the Tribune trucks right there. No, people are still getting, getting the newspaper. So going back to um, the beginning of my tour in the early 1800s, I talked about how quickly Chicago grew. We went in the 1800s from 150 people to over a million people by the end of the century. And that was quick growth. Chicago was successful. It was a thriving business city. But it was very, very dirty. And one of the sources of pollution was our Chicago River because everything was getting dumped into the river as if it was a sewer. And that was flowing out into the lake. The lake is the source of our drinking water. So in the 1850s, a sewer system was created, but that did not completely solve the problem. In the 1870s, around that time, there was a terrible outbreak Where the yeast nest 
anyway, um, they were drilling to create these pilings, and they struck an underwater tunnel at the turn of the century, flooded out the city, 1992. And then we have this raised bridge here. This is an old railway bridge. This dates from the uh, mid-1800s, and it's a historic landmark now, so they keep it permanently raised. But it's a great example to show you a Trunion Vasco bridge. Look at that big weight at the base of the bridge that counterbalances the leaf of the bridge. That's usually what's embedded in the soil. But a lot of people love to have their pictures taken on Kinsey Street Bridge with that in the background. I see wedding parties all the time doing that because it's really representative of old working Chicago and the history of Chicago. Um, this area right here, we have three towers, Wolf Point West we're passing, Salesforce Tower, Wolf Point East. However, they're sitting on what used to be the oldest part of Chicago called Wolf Point. Legend has it that there was a farmer with chickens and the wolf ate up all his chickens and he shot the wolf, hence the name Wolf Point. However, these were very controversial for Riverbend. Look how they changed Riverbend's view. Riverbend used to see all the way down the river and it obstructed their view. So Riverbend actually fought the construction of these towers, but they did not prevail because that's what happens in the city. Wherever you move, look around. If you're moving into the city, see if there's a parking lot, if there's an open space, if there's an old building that might be demolished, your view could feasibly change. But that's the way Chicago works, and a lot of times the view is even better. So we just never know. All right, we are back on the main branch. Everybody doing well? Yeah. Still hanging in there? Yeah. All right. Beautiful day. So we are in the last portion of our tour, and if you look straight ahead, there's a massive reinforced concrete building. So if you're on the river walk tonight around 8.30 and 9, there is um, a, 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 an art show called the Art on the Mart that happens. You have to look up the exact time because it changes, but I think it's 8.30 and 9. They project an entire art show on the facade of this massive building, and they project it from the other side of the consolidation of warehouse industry and um, it is an art deco building that covers an entire city block it's 4.25 million square feet second in size only to the Pentagon um, it is a huge building you've got those chevrons the gold leafing some of the facade is a little worse for the wear. The interior of the building is absolutely beautiful. So on the weekdays you can go in. I highly recommend just to see the beautiful architecture. Another old warehouse building we're passing is home to the Chicago School of Psychology. The states to 1913, at the building does. Um, and then at the top it says Dirty. That is a sustainable office renovation company. That stands for doing it right this time. Not a commentary of the condition of the building. And then again, another old warehouse. So I promised you at the beginning of the tour, you'd see a lot of these uh, examples of adaptive reuse, old warehouses that used to be part of the shipping industry in Chicago. We have the Reed, Ar Reed, Murba, no, Reed Murdoch building coming up on the left. And that was designed in 1913 by George Nimitz. Also did riverbank lots on the North Branch. Now this is more of a prairie style building. It is now home to Whirlpool showrooms as well as Encyclopedia Botanica. That clock tower is not only a design feature, it's, it was a practical feature for a time where people didn't wear wristwatches as much as we do, certainly didn't have cell phones to um, tell the time. So they the employees relied on that clock for the designer of Hancock and the Sears Tower also designed this green glass building on the left that says RPM Seafood. That is uh, uh, a, also home to the American buildings that compose Marina Towers. There's pretty much nothing you see filmed in Chicago that does not um, show Marina. 
Marina Towers at some point in the filming. These are 1960s. You may recognize the same design as River City on the South Branch. Same architect, Bertram Goldberg. So he loved that, that round shape. There are concrete cores onto which the, um, the floors are put on like petals to the scent, stem of a flower. Truly, as it says, iconic architecture, mid-century design that was very different than uh, his teacher, Louis Vandrow. Behind there, that sloping roof is the House of Blues, and behind that is the Hotel Chicago, and then Smith & Walensky Steak House, which is really fantastic. Now, his round towers are next to East Vandro, his teacher. Um, we're coming up to what was formerly known as the IBM building. This is an AMA plaza that stands for American Medical Association. It's home to that as well as the Langham Hotel, which has at one point been voted the best hotel in the United States. It's a British hotel and this building is the oh, second from. largest building Mies van der Rohe created and the last one he did before he passed away in fact it was uh, finished after he passed away now the architect of the very tallest buildings in the world such as the Burj Khalifa and the Jeddah Tower is Adrian Smith remember that name he's done a towers we will see including Trump International Hotel and condominiums. This was completed in 2009 and replaced a much smaller building for the Sun Times. So it was very important he felt that his tall tower which is the second tallest in Chicago did not overwhelm the historical icons around it. So he created it with setbacks to correspond to the heights of the surrounding towers. For instance, this first setback is corresponding to the top of the Wrigley Building coming up here on the left. The Wrigley Building is a 1920s tower that really started what we now know as the Magnificent Mile of Chicago or Michigan Avenue. It was the first commercial building on this property in a whole industrial area. It's Spanish Renaissance and it actually is patterned after the Hobalda Tower in Spain, 15th century Belfry. You have what is one of the first fully illuminated buildings in Chicago and to, in my estimation one of the most elegant we have here. Now we're following the flotilla so I think you'll get a chance to see the, the raised bridge. This just closed. You can always see a mass of people that have been waiting for the bridge to close. But straight ahead, you'll see that Columbus Avenue Bridge is now open, so this is a great picture opportunity. And I do want to point out the Tribune Tower on the left with that Gothic top that's patterned after the Rouen Cathedral in France. That was home to the Chicago Tribune newspaper. They have since moved out. It's a 1920s building. Um, now you can live here. This is Tribune Residence. I'll just let you enjoy this view. This is really fun. So when I started giving the tours this morning, it was 10 o'clock and the boats were, I think, just five bridges to the west here. So that's how long it can take sometimes for these boats to get to where they're going because it just takes a little while for the bridges, bridge operators and there are a lot of variables to that but but they've had a long time waiting for for, for their uh, what time is it now? Crazy. <laughs> On the left is the NBC Tower. Now that might look a little bit familiar to you because Rockefeller Center, 30 Rock in New York, is a true Art Deco tower in that style. This is a 1980 uh, nine tower by eight of the tallest buildings in the world. So anyway, that is more of an Echo Deco tower. And look at that wedding, so pretty. See, I told you the bridge. Chicago besides architecture. <laughs>